Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Polly. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> By God's grace, in a program called Alcoholics Anonymous, I haven't had a drink since April the 11th of 1977, and for that, I am eternally grateful. And uh, I have a sponsor. My sponsor has a sponsor. I have a home group, and that's the West Connect Group in Jacksonville, Florida. We meet at 8 o'clock on Monday night, so if you're ever in Jacksonville, Florida, please look us up. And Dave and I are in the phone book. When you're sober, you can be in the phone book. So it's all great. Uh, There are not words to describe how I feel about being here today. Um, I can't, you know, it's uh, when Bob called me and invited me, it's like and told me what was going to be happening is uh, I'm, I'm a real alcoholic. And the first question I said, but why me? You know, it's, uh, this is, you know, this is like so special and it's the first one. And, uh, this is, you know, it's, it's Mother's Day weekend. Um, and I know that everybody is as touched as I am. And, uh, I got to, the first time I saw Dr. Bob's house was when I was 10 years sober. And, uh, it had, I guess they had just about, were just getting it and rebought it and had bought it. And I was speaking at a little, uh, banquet, maybe a little more than 10 years sober in Youngstown. And uh, a guy, the guy said, have you ever been to Dr. Bob's house? And I said, no. And I didn't even know where Akron was compared to Youngstown. I was living in Southern California. And I got to come, and I, I was so touched then. And uh, and we, we sat at Dr. Bob's, you know, at, Susan's be- at Sue's bed, and we did the third step prayer. And that's where Dr. Bob used to take, you know, and, and just, you know, Make them surrender, and uh, and it was it was fabulous, and I've I've just been so touched, and the speakers, I mean, it's just been amazing, you know, Paul and Gail and Sandy, I mean, just listen at these names, Ralph and um, Bob and Clancy, Marilyn and Tom. I mean, you know, it's just. How do you, how do you, how do you say how grateful you are to be around giants like that? And I'm just so grateful and I love the people who have worked so hard. I know Lee and Bob because I've kind of been around them a few, you know, since this all started and I know they've been working hard. Happen to know what Dolly's up to. And so that's in Chris and Mary Beth and all the, uh, Cleveland girls. So. It's, uh, I'm honored. I just can't begin to tell you how honored I am. Um, uh, I just, um, I have to tell a little story about this weekend. And I think it's just, um, so I've, I've never done steps eight and nine since we've been doing this. This has not been the steps I've done. And uh, when I got the little thing and I saw, oh, I'm doing steps eight and nine. And uh, I just, you know, I think that I have... Uh, there's some beautiful, beautiful healing that has taken place in my life and in my family's life as a result of those two steps. And, uh, of course, if I hadn't done the other six steps, I couldn't, I have the seven steps, I guess I'm on eight, huh? The other seven <laughs> steps, I couldn't do the eighth step. But... Uh, there's uh, there's a lot of healing that has taken place as a result of the amend steps, and um, one of the things that uh, happened for me is that uh, when I did, I, I'm a person who was the reluctant to get sober. There's some there's some people here in this room that are talking this weekend that are the reluctant to get sober, and I'm the reluctant to get sober. And a lot of times I'll hear things like, there weren't treatment centers back when I got sober. And I'm 35 years sober, and there's people who even has less sobriety say there weren't treatment centers. Well, I promise you, Bob and I found them. We found a lot of treatment centers. (laughs) 
there were treatment centers. And um, one of the things that I was listening to, and I can't remember, uh, oh, everybody runs kind of runs in, but about being able to, you know, I hope I never get too sober to call a newcomer. And one of the things is, is that if it required me to go to somebody and ask them to help me to get sober, I don't know if I'd be here today because I didn't come here willingly. After my, I, after going to my third treatment center, I was court committed to that treatment center. My husband obtained a court order that sent me to a treatment center in Dallas, Texas. So I didn't even come here by calling anybody. I came here because I was forced to come here because I came here beside a suicide attempt that the state of Texas didn't take too kindly to. They didn't like people doing that. And uh, so I got put on one of those little 72-hour holds, which was enough time for my husband to obtain a court order that court committed me to treatment. And I don't know, that was my third treatment center. The other two hadn't taken and uh, I was in that treatment center. What was different from that treatment center, from any other treatment, the other two, I don't know. I have no idea. The only thing, because the other two treatment centers had introduced me to Alcoholics Anonymous. They were detox centers, so they really were taking you to Alcoholics Anonymous. This was a fancy jitter joint. And I don't know what the difference was. The only thing is, I got it. And today, I know that I didn't get anything. God removed it. He removed the obsession to drink. And by God's grace, I had enough distance between me and that drink when I entered the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous that I was ready to do whatever it took to do it. Not too long ago, in fact, just a couple of months ago, because I was sober in April, one of the women, one of the first women I'd sponsored in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I was only like 18 months old when I started sponsoring her, and uh, so she has just, you know, not even two years less than me now. But she said, you were so desperate. You would have done anything anybody told you to do. And I'm here to tell you, that's it. I was so desperate for sobriety. One of the things that uh, happens, I got sober in Texas. And in Texas, uh, it's just what they do. It's how I got sober. I came out of that treatment center. I had done what it was a five-step treatment center. <clears throat> I thought I had done the five steps. My sponsor informed me I hadn't that that was that the four step I had taken was a Hazelton psychobabble and it didn't count. So I did the steps again with him. And in Texas we did the steps quickly. And I am so grateful for that. And uh I loved what Sandy says that sometimes we get, you know, we're too easy on the newcomer. Uh I don't think that I'm a person who's easy on the newcomer. I'm just not, I just am not a person that can be angry and rude. So that's just not me. So if that's being too soft, then that's me. But that's who I am. And what happens is, is that I remember Frank telling me, you can tell anybody the truth if you tell it with love. And uh, and that's all I ever see around here, all these people down here. You know, you may not like what they say to you, and it might dig your little feelings, like me being a minute late to get up here. Thank you, Clancy. <laughs> Clancy yelled at me. If you didn't hear it, <laughs> he yelled at me. But you know what? There was a time, and I love this, there was a time that that would hurt my feelings. But you know what? If you stay around here long enough and you get to where you accept when you're wrong and get up and do it, doesn't hurt anymore because I was wrong. I needed to have my butt up here, and I didn't. I'm too busy talking. That's my problem. I love people. I'm too busy talking. And uh, But what happens is, is that uh, I have gotten to where today 
that I'm just not so sensitive. And when somebody tells me something, I know today that they love me and they're doing that. They tell me the truth, whether I want to hear it or not, because they love me. And there was a time I didn't get that. But I had a sponsor that was able to do that for me. And uh, there's a guy sitting back there named Jack. And Jack was best friends with Frank Honeycutt. And Frank Honeycutt sponsored Frank Fitzpatrick, which was my first sponsor. And uh, and you know how you just kind of keep all that stuff going. And Frank got sober at the Naval Hospital in Long Beach. And uh, he had a lot of tough guys around him. He was a Monsignor priest in the Navy. He was an only child. And... All, and he was a Catholic priest, all of these things. And what happened was, is I don't think God makes any mistakes about who you get for a sponsor. Because one of the things that I had heard later on, after I had the sponsor, I didn't know the rules, okay? I didn't know the AA rules. And this guy, this man had 12 step me out of a, motel room in Euless, Texas, and I mean, I had a lot, a lot of stuff had happened, and he ended up becoming my sponsor, and, uh, and he was a man, but God sent me who I needed. He sent me a Catholic priest, and I'm Southern Baptist, so both of us know how to, you know, we were spoon-fed guilt. That's what was wrong with us. I'm an only child, and I'm an Air, an Air Force wife, and I'll just tell you, on my, on my resentment list, I didn't have all that many resentments when I, I had a lot more later. But when I first came in, I accumulated them in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> but when I got here, one of the, two of the resentments I had was the Baptist Church in the U.S. Air Force. And I feel like that I was given exactly what I needed. But what happened is, is when I finished giving him my fifth step, and we laid out some really uh, hurtful uh, character defects that he had no problem in pointing them out to me, one of which I manipulate through kindness. That's an icky thing because that's so abusive. And when I got through, when he got through with that, he looked at me, And he told me, he says, Polly, you are a child abuser. And he didn't tell me, Polly, you have hurt your sons. He said, Polly, you are a child abuser. And I'm telling you, nothing has cut me to the core as somebody to say that to me. That, because I can't, because see, here's the thing. When you're an alcoholic, the deal is, I loved my sons. I loved him. The only thing is, is I'm an alcoholic. And I had a son who was an athlete. I had a son who was a musician. And I would promise my kids, and their dad was gone. So he did, you know, he was like almost not in the picture because this is Vietnam War. This was all of this stuff was going on. And I'm telling you, he was gone almost like a three year stretch. And I had these sons. And they'd say, I'd tell them, I'll be there. And, you know, of course, I'm an alcoholic. So I'd take a drink of alcohol. I'd pass out on the sofa, and I couldn't make it. And then I would be awakened by one of those little faces that said, Mom, you promised you'd be there. But because I'm an alcoholic, I'm saying, well, can't you see I'm sick you know, don't you care about me? Look at, you know, it's all about me. Look what's happening. All you're worried about whether I'm going to be there or not. And strike out at these little boys. Alcoholism, a family disease. And I had a sponsor who was not at all worried about my feelings when he told me that I was a child abuser. And he told me that I was going to go to those little boys and that I was going to make amends. And, I, I mean, what do you do? And I, I, I said, well, what do I say? And 
he told me, he says, you get a little three by five card and we're going to write out what you're going to say and what you're going to say to those boys. And then you're going to ask them if they have anything to say to you. And then you're going to have a little saying here that says, I'm so sorry that that happened to you and I will spend the rest of my life being the very best mom I can be. And uh, I went that day, and uh, I met with those little boys. And uh, at that time, they were 14 and 16 years old. And uh, they were two angry, angry young men, young boys. They were so angry at me. They didn't have much to say to me. And I told them all of this stuff. I don't know, I know my son Russ rolled his eyes. I think we've, we've have later found out James was stoned. So, <laughs> so <laughs> he doesn't recall much of that. <laughs> and, uh, but Russ rolled his eyes and, uh, and I asked them, I said, do you have anything to say to me? And I will assure you, they had plenty to say. They were very, very angry. And every time they would say something, I would just say, I'm so sorry that that happened to you. And I will spend the rest of my life being the very best mom I can be. Now, when we do all this stuff because a sponsor tells us to do it, we're told to do it in Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know that it's going to ever do any good. All I know is, is that I'm told to do it. And I have that gift, and I call it a gift. I had that gift of desperation that I don't care what he would have told me to do, I would have done it because I couldn't stand it. And the reason I had tried to kill myself and got in all, you know, all the attention of the authorities is for the very thing that Clancy talks about and you've heard Bob talk about and all the other speakers. And that is, I can't stand sober. I can't stand sober. And when I'm sober, I can't, I can't live with me. I can't stand sober. And so what happens is, is that, uh, I did what I was told to do with the desperation of being able to do whatever I was told I was asked to do. Not ask, I was pretty much told. I don't know that I was asked to do anything. Uh, and I'm not much of a suggester either. I'm pretty much, this is what you need to do. And, uh, but what happened is, is just let me tell you what happened on Thursday. So if you do this work, you don't know what's going to happen 35 years later. You just go do the work because the sponsor told you to do it. So uh, I talked to my I talked to James a lot, and uh, he's uh, he's in the program. He's sober and uh, sober 28 years, and he's right behind me. We can, we grew up together in this program, and. Uh, but he's kind of had some struggles of his own lately, and so we've been talking a lot. So he knew I was coming here, and he knew I was going to get to do this. And I said, oh, I'd give anything if you could, you know, come and be with, you know, be at the weekend and all that. And he said, oh, Mom, I can't. You know, I really need to, you know, stay at home and da da da, da you know, all these different things. So anyway... Fran, who drove me, thank you so much for being my hostess. And Fran was driving me to the hotel, and James called me on the telephone. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, Fran is just about to drive me up to the hotel. And uh, and I said, what are you doing? And he says, oh, it doesn't look like it's going to be all that great a weekend, you know, just more of the same stuff this weekend. And I said, oh, honey, I'm so sorry, or something like that, that I do. And we walked in this hotel, and Jack, I was giving Jack a hug, and Dolly's pulling on me. Come on, you got to come here, come here. I said, Dolly, let me give Jack a hug. And so Dolly keeps pulling on me. And just about that time, James walks around the corner, 
and he says, Happy Mother's Day. Probably, yo, know, and the thing about it is, why don't you stand up, son? I'm going to embarrass you totally. <laughs> <laughs> it's so hard for him. It's like I, I'm so bad about that, embarrassing people I love. Anyway, <laughs> uh, but what happens is, is another amends that we don't always know that we're making is that we come into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and we do what we're told to do here. We suit up, we show up, we go to meetings, we do the work, we do the things that we're told to do in Alcoholics Anonymous. And what we don't realize sometimes is that we're walking big books, that what we're doing is we're walking a day at a time showing this program worked. Six and a half years after I got sober, my youngest son, James, called me on the phone, and he said, Mom, I want what you have. And I said, Honey, if you want what I have, and of course, I have been ruining him. This is the thing you don't do. I'm saving a seat for you. I have the sponsor picked out for you. I'm doing all the wrong things that you do in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, trying to, you know, trying to, I'm trying to get James sober. It's not God's job. It's my job to get James sober. And uh, But what happened was, is James was living in Texas, and Dave and I were living in California, and James called me on the phone, and he said, Mom, I want what you have. And uh, I said, well, sweetheart, you need to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. And he says, oh, I don't think so, Mom. I don't think I want it that bad. And he hung up. <laughs> But he found his way to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and he went. And he started going, and a friend I had, and I mean, it's just how, it's it's like we're here in Akron, and every little brick had to go into the, I hear you talk about that all the time, Gail, is every little brick that took place had to take place in order for us to be sitting here today. Well, it's in all our lives, every little brick had to be exactly as that little brick is for your life and my life in order for us to get what we get from this program. And that's what happened with me. And I ended up sponsoring a woman in Texas who James had showed up at a few meetings, and she called him and asked him to take a woman to a meeting. And he went to that meeting, I mean, wasn't any special meeting, just went to this meeting, a guy was speaking, and he got it. And that day, the magic and the grace of God happened to him, and the disease was lifted from him. And he started showing up at meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And what I have heard James say through the years, because I've heard him share in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous too, is that I knew AA worked because I saw the transformation that AA did in my mother. I knew it worked. Because, you see, I'm not the same woman I was when I came in here. I'm not. This this program says that we have a, we are transformed. We have a spiritual awakening and a psychic rearrangement. That's what happens here. And one of the things that I know is that if I don't do what I know I need to do, I know that that book is right, that I only get a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance which tells me I need to do something to maintain my sobriety on the maintenance of my sobriety. I could be that woman again. I know I could be that woman again. And I don't ever, ever want to be that woman again. That angry, mean woman. And James makes jokes. He says that he's going bald because I pulled his hair out. (laughs) 
said, because I don't want to be that person anymore. I want to be the person I am today. I want to be the person that James and Kelly would write a will, and if anything happened to them, that Dave and I would be have guardian of their children. That's the person I want to be today. That person that would be able to be entrusted with those children, and I wasn't I shouldn't have even been allowed to have those children. So the gifts of making amends, did I not think I could do it? I didn't. I thought it was way too hard. And then the amends came back to me six and a half years later. James made amends to me. And then in 2000, right on a Sunday afternoon after the International in Minneapolis, James and I sat on his front porch and he said, Mom, I made just a kind of a, you know, a half-assed amends to you when I made amends to you and I want to make amends again. And we sat on that porch for an hour or so and we did it again in 2000. And it was at a different level and a different way. But we were able one more time to amend that situation at a different point in our lives. And it's, and all that happens as a result of that is it just grows. My oldest son had a lot of problems. Uh, he moved to California. He didn't have any problems with me being an AA till he and his wife, 20, over 20 years ago, moved to Southern California. And they lived really close to us. And he could not stand me doing what I did in Alcoholics Anonymous. He, um, he felt like that I, you know, I didn't pay any attention to him or his family and that I was always doing things in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, and I know today that that was just what was going on with him. Because I was that I don't believe that to be true. Because I believe I was doing a good job of being a mom and taking care of uh, the kids, and which I did a lot. But what happens is, is he was having his own problems. And uh, two years ago, Russ has had a lot of struggles through his life. And two years ago, he got sober in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. He doesn't do AA now. He does church. I, I, you know, it's, I have no, I, there's nothing I can do about that, but he's sober. And the difference is, is he sees me differently. He sees his brother differently. He sees a lot of things differently. So we've been able to have some other talks. So more amends have been made. Okay, I want to reel back to the beginning of sobriety. And uh, I'm grateful, I am so grateful that I was told to do the steps quickly. I did the steps quickly in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I was told to get on with my amends and to do the things I did because my daddy died when I was one year sober. And by God's grace and this program, I had the opportunity to make amends to my dad before he died. And I'm so grateful again that I had that kind of sponsorship because if I hadn't have, I would have missed that opportunity to make amends to my dad. And uh, I'm an only child, and uh, I was raised by... Uh, by people who were just very, very middle class to lower class. I mean, they were just beautiful people. And I didn't have a lot of money, but I saw love in action. My parents did not have a lot of money. But what happened was, is they were two abused children who had found each other. And one expressed that abuse by anger, the other by just holding it in. And I resented both of that. I hated the anger, and I thought my mother was disgusting. She, you don't stand up for yourself, you don't have a voice, blah, 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 but you're, you know, all of this stuff. But what happened, thanks to 
the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I was able to see a little, a little window, because I was only a year sober. I was able to see a little window of how much sacrifice my parents had done for me because I was a gymnast and a dancer, and both of those things cost a lot of money. But they sacrificed and worked and did everything they could to see to it that I got to do that. But I was so selfish and self-centered as a kid, I just took it all for granted and just figured, you know, I... I, I couldn't even really feel the love. I was so shut. I was so spiritually ill when I came here. I couldn't even really feel that love that my parents had for me. And I'm just so grateful that I was able to make that amends to my dad and tell him how sorry I was I took him for granted. And I was able to be there when he died. I was able, I was able for the next 27 years to be the kind of daughter that any mother would want to have because you taught me how to do that. And I got to be that for my mother for 27 years. And I'm so grateful that I was allowed to do that in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, <clears throat> we're going to do some amends in sobriety. I created a lot of wreckage when I got sober. Uh, some of it's kind of funny, some of it's not too funny. But uh, I created this wreckage. I came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I just knew that if you'd love me enough, I'd be okay. So I don't know how many people we have that are new in sobriety, but that think, uh, you know, a relationship will fix you. And I was just sure that that's all I needed. Plus, if you've been drinking a quart of vodka, uh, I don't know how, I, I don't, a quart of vodka probably a day, I'm not even sure, and taking a whole bunch of Librium, Valium, Secondol, and Imutol, I mean, you are, not, I'm not conscious much. And, uh, I woke up and my libido woke up. And at that time, my husband was really ill. And uh, he had been um, 100% disabled. He was retired from the military. He was very, very ill. And uh, I wake up, and I feel put upon because I'm 36 years old, and I am not about to be ready to give up sex and all the stuff that I need because he's ill. And I started a whirlwind in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, so this I was not a program of attraction, unless you were sick as I was, and that probably was an attraction. And uh, But I started a whirlwind in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I used and abused men for my own satisfactions. I don't think they were that disappointed, but, you know, it was... It was still done. And uh, it was not what we do here. It's not what we do here. And uh, I ended up at two years of sobriety, sobriety, sitting in an abortion clinic, 38 years old, with all the 16-year-olds having an abortion because of actions I took that placed me in a position to be hurt. So now I've created more wreckage. Now I, in sobriety, have taken a life. I have done all of this stuff that I've got to make amends for. And I, and again, I'm still sponsored by Frank. And uh, he's not taken a lot of pity on me. And he believes that I owe amends for my behavior. And I began to make those amends that I'd created sober in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. My husband. Um, I made amends to my husband when I first got sober. The greatest amends I made to my husband was 14 years ago. 
and um, he had been uh, he had been sick all that time, and he was diagnosed with cancer, and he was dying. And um, James had been going to see his dad and doing the things that a good member of Alcoholics Anonymous does to be a good son. And I was talking to his dad on the on the phone, and I said, you know, I don't think I ever made a really good amends to you and uh, how much I harmed you. And, you know, the best thing in his life, really, was that I left. And uh, that was the best thing. I fell in love with another member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's turned out to be a fabulous but it wasn't fabulous at the time. There were a lot of people that were hurt badly. My oldest son says today that the worst thing ever happened to him was a, you know, his parents getting divorced. Well, now he's divorced, so he understands a little better. But I was able to make a really true amends to him before he died. And uh, I felt like I just, you know, there was just something in me that felt like I needed to do that. And these are the things that we get to do in sobriety. We get to, and I mean, I hit, I hit it, you know, I gave it the best shot I could give at, in early in sobriety. But as I got more sober, I realized there was more to do. The other thing is, is that um, a lot of, we've had, uh, Dave and I, I'm married to a man named Dave Pistol. My last name is for real. It's not made up. Uh, and uh, Dave and I fell in love when we were three and a half and four and a half years sober. And uh, Dave and I have been married to each other for 32 years. And I think that's a pretty good record for two alcoholics hooked up in AA. So we've done we've done pretty good. And he's still my hero. I still love him absolutely to pieces. And uh, we get to walk this walk together. Um, anyway, Dave and I, along, we're rocking along in about 16 and 17 years of sobriety. Uh, we're speaking in Alcoholics Anonymous. We're sponsoring people. We're doing a deal. And uh, lo and behold, Dave gets laid off from his job. Now, Dave's a computer scientist. They were people were always calling him, headhunters, wanting wanting him to move here and there in the next place, and uh, and you know a job offer here and a job offer there. And we didn't think that was any big deal. It's going to be fine. That's you know it's going to work just fine. And uh, what happened is, is that it didn't work fine. It was an economy in 1993, a lot about like it is right now. And what happened is, is the bottom had fallen out of aerospace in Southern California. Our whole block went up for sale, like so many places today are like that. And we couldn't sell our house. Well, it was way different back then. I think he got either six weeks or six months, I can't remember, of unemployment. So that was it. And uh, nobody was helping anybody out with mortgages. So what happened is, is our house got foreclosed on. And we ended up having to file bankruptcy. <clears throat> and all these things are things I just can't bear to do in sobriety. I mean, I didn't want to talk anymore. I didn't want to do any of those things anymore. And uh, I had a man in, a man in my life who was um, my husband's sponsor, who had been my sponsor's sponsor and was my son's sponsor, a man by the name of Frank Honeycutt, finest man I've ever known. And uh, he was in my life, and I kept saying, you know, and Dottie is my sponsor, Dottie Harris is my sponsor, and I've watched her walk through a lot of stuff in her life. And I didn't want to speak anymore. And she says, Polly, our whole, everything that happens in our life is useful to somebody else. And Frank, and I said something to Frank, and I said, what will people think of me? And Frank said, it's none of your business what people think of you. 
but your life depends on what you think of them. And so I would tell this story. And so what happened was is that we had filed this bankruptcy and uh and we'd had the foreclosure turned out to be uh something that was great because somebody ended up buying the house and they got it a really good deal on it. We ended up renting a house that was twice as big as the house we had, and we ended up taking people into our home until we left Southern California because we had the room and we had the space. So anyway, uh, that happened, and uh, then Dave got a job. And what we did is I believe that money is energy and that what goes around comes around. And it was important to Dave and I to pay back that money and to the best of our ability. Now, there's some places <clears throat> that wouldn't take our money because it would mess their books up. So we found other ways to do that, and one of the ways is is that we had four different women live with us. We did not charge rent. We didn't do anything like that. We simply helped these women. And we began to do some things that would be able to be a, a restitution for that money in a different way that we would use. And, uh, and a lot of it we were able to pay back. Now, I've learned this. I did not owe a pennies bill, but I've learned this by sharing my experience with other women that I sponsor who have had pennies bills. Now, what I have found out is, is that if you go to J.C. Penney's and say that you want to make an amends in Alcoholics Anonymous, they have a fund for that. And they use that to buy clothes for people who can't afford to buy clothes. And they do that for the, for the amends from people in Alcoholics Anonymous. So it's fabulous. I didn't even know that that happened. But if, you know, hang around and you learn all kinds of things in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, <clears throat> so Dave and I were able to make a lot of the restitution, and then we had to do, with the help of Frank and Dottie, some creative things <laughs> in order to pay back the money that we owed. And, uh, and we were able to do that. And <clears throat> then I love what Bob was saying today, is that, you know, then you're scared, you're afraid, you're having financial problems, and you just, you just know you're going to die. You just know you're going to die. You're not going to live through this. You're going to be homeless. You're not, I mean, it's all of this, you know, stuff that goes on in your head because I've got a really busy head. And uh, you know that all this stuff is going on in your head, and it's not good. And like my husband says, my head is not my amigo. It's just not my friend. And so two years ago, James and Kelly were invested in our house in Birch Bay. James' business goes south with the economy. So now we have to put our house in Birch Bay up for sale. And I'm like standing there. Second verse, same song, same economy, same, you know, if we'd have sold that house two years before, we'd have got triple what it was worth. But anyway, that's not what happened. And most people didn't call it like that. A lot of people didn't call it like that. So, but the difference is, is we weren't afraid. That's the difference. We knew that, you know, it's, it's amazing what happens when you've been through it, you know that God's going to take care of you. You just know it. And that's what happened. It just was taken care of. And our heartbreak in Birch Bay, we bought somebody's heartbreak in Jacksonville. And, you know, it just, it's just, it's just the way it is. And it's been really good.
to have that. Um, I had, Dave has a daughter, and uh, we've done a lot of praying for his daughter. And uh, she's 50 years old, and uh, she has been running and gunning since she was 15 years old. And uh, she's had some periods of sobriety. And uh, I've made, I have said things to Dave sometime that were not uh, the best things, like, you know, he needs to do this, we need to do that. And Dave's not near as Alanani as me. He doesn't have the need to help people and save people the way I do. And, uh, and he just, you know, he just kept saying, you know, Polly, it's in God's hands, it's in God's hands, it's in God's hands. And uh, a few weeks ago, Kim sent her dad an email and said, I know you can help me because you're sober in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and, uh, I, you know, I just, if you'll just call me. So Dave calls, no answer. And then a couple of days later, he gets a phone call from her husband that she's in a treatment center in Michigan. And, uh, well, I'm all over it. I'm just all over it. I'm so excited. I don't know what to do. Now, Dave's sitting back, and he's, you know, he's just, you know, just kind of sitting back. So the next thing we know, Dave hasn't heard. We sent letters and cards because we couldn't talk to her. So Dave calls his ex-wife and uh, finds out that she has left the treatment center. She has told her mother that she has left the treatment center and she has learned so much and she's done so well, they want her to stay there and teach. <laughs> In the meantime, of course, Dave says, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> and then the next question his ex-wife says to him is, well, I tried to get some of my money back from sending her there. And Dave said, oh, how much money did you put up? And she said, $20,000. So Dave just sort of said, well, nothing's changed. He said, the only difference is, is she didn't tap me because she knew I didn't have it. Is the only reason she didn't tap me. But the deal is, is that, you know, we're still here. We're still waiting. We've done, you know, and it's just one of those things that you make amends. You do all the stuff this program tells you to do. And maybe, and sometimes it doesn't turn out the way you want it to turn out. It just doesn't. It doesn't happen. And the heartbreak doesn't end. The heartbreak stays. And that's what's happened with Kim. Is that we've done these things, and now, and Dave just sat there and just, you know, with a broken heart and just said, I don't know if I'll ever see her again. But the good news is, is that Dave loves women in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. So he's collected a few daughters in this program that fill up his heart and make him just, and he just loves it. And he loves the opportunity to be a dad to these women. And uh, so what happens is, is I think we get blessed no matter what. If we just go and do the work, and it doesn't look like it's turning out, it's that disease of perception that Clancy talks about. That it's like it doesn't it doesn't look like it's good. It's just my perception that it doesn't. But there's a lot of women that Dave has an opportunity to be able to be a dad to who don't have dads, who would like to have somebody in their life to be that figure. And you know, we all get to do that from time to time. I get to there's women in my life that I get the opportunity to do that. 
there's some guys in my life that I get to do that. There's a kid in Jacksonville that I get to do that, whose mother died. And I get to kind of be a mom to him. He got sober with James down in Texas, but now he lives in Jacksonville. So we get to do these things if we'll just do the work, do the things that is dictated in this program if we'll just take the actions and do the work. Whenever I get that feeling down in my, that just that icky feeling, that is my barometer that I probably owe an amends and that I need to go, I need to do a spot-checked inventory because more than likely I've harmed somebody in some way. I was just talking to a sponsee I have in Mississippi, and uh, Ralph and I share the love of her, and I was talking to her, and I was teasing her because she has a pretty kind of a icky situation, and so I was teasing her. And I said something, and the line just went silent. And I thought, and I, you know, I stopped for a minute, and I thought, oh, that was so insensitive. That wasn't funny. You know, I thought it was funny at the time. It wasn't funny. When it hit her, it wasn't funny. So that's one of those times that you just stop and make amends for something you've done because you've harmed somebody. I cut her to the quick. And she said, I just never would have thought you would say something to me like that. And I said, you know, I can't believe I said that either. And I'm not above those kind of things. I'm not above doing those things today. So it doesn't really matter, you know, at least I don't do it all the time anymore. I don't hurt people's feelings. I don't use and abuse people. I don't take advantage of people as much. I still do it because I am a, I am still a human being and having, uh, as my AA sponsor likes to say, you're a spiritual being having a human experience. <laughs> And I have done things that have hurt people deeply. But thank God you have taught me. And maybe, just maybe, I have a little less Polly and a little more God that I'm willing to admit when I'm wrong. And uh, there was a beautiful man in Alcoholics Anonymous, and his name was Keith Lewis. And Keith used to talk about in his talk he used to say, his sponsor said, Keith, write on your mirror, I am wrong. And he said, it is a spiritual experience to admit when we're wrong. And what I know today is, is that it is a spiritual experience to admit when I'm wrong. It's really hard, and I don't like to do it, but when I do it, I get that peace that we get when we know we've done the right thing. And to me, it doesn't say this in the big book, but to me, I like to say that step nine is the freedom step. And I'm grateful that I have a lot more freedom today than I did 35 years ago. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.